Okay, um, welcome back everyone again. We're about to get ready to go into the afternoon session. Um, so Dr. Nolan's going to speak again this time. Um, something that might interest you, an online AMD research study for optometrists current practice in the Republic of Ireland and <coughs> UK. Thanks. Jim. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> so as I said this morning, I had three ideas and I had three points that I wanted to present today. This morning we reminded ourselves about the risk factors for age-related macular degeneration and how a key risk factor is, is, is indeed nutrition and, and now what we know about mesozeaxant and the potential that this has um, for the patients that, that, that you test daily and um, even not just AMD patients but every patient the fact that goes into your clinic is at some degree of risk of age-related macular degeneration and um, of late we've been hearing several successful what we term as case studies around uh, carotenoid supplementation and various patients claiming that they have improved in different ways um, some of this we've even seen when we look at fundus photography, you can see the drusen that Professor Beattie discussed this morning almost even resolve in some situations. But, you know, you have to look at case studies and individual cases with their limitations and that they are indeed just case studies. So we believe that it was important to try and <clears throat> get some form, of, um, some form of idea and try and quantify at some level at least what's happening because... Of course, uh, patients have been supplementing for the last number of years. So there's a lot of important information that you see day to day uh, with patients who you have had on supplements. So um, Macuvision uh, Europe um, agreed to support a, a study in conjunction with the um, uh, College of Optometrists in the UK and in conjunction with the Association of Optometrists in Ireland. And, and the idea here was that we worked together, our team, to come up with, I think it was 12 questions around uh, AMD, current practice, what you currently do, how, what decisions you make r around uh, assessing macular degeneration and making recommendations thereafter. And so we felt it, would use, it was useful to um, conduct it, this study. And that's what I want to present to you. And I feel it's appropriate to do that now because this morning we've gone through the facts, the science, the publications, and what we know from the, the recent clinical trials. I'm now going to tell you what you're actually doing. And then I'm going to tell you in the last part of my talk what I think you should be doing based on, on, on where we are. So th there's three messages. Okay, out of interest, has anyone in this room, did any of you participate in this online survey? Did you receive the email? I, I, see, I see one. A uh, couple of hands there, so yeah. Um, so the method of, of this investigation, as I say, was the Association of Optometrists in Ireland and the College of Optometrists in the UK invited all their members to uh, participate in this online survey. 750 emails were circulated in Ireland and 8,049 were circulated in the United Kingdom. Um, reminder emails were also sent after six weeks. The survey was open for a total of three months and we had an 8.2% response, which we found was very good. We predicted it tends to be between 4 and 5%. So we, we had nearly double what, what we um, anticipated. And the questions, which, as I say, were formulated by all our team, Professor Beattie, Dr. Lockman, um, myself, were, were designed to obtain information regarding AMD assessment techniques and information on nutritional supplements used to manage age-related macular degeneration. Some very generic and basic information I think you might be interested in. The first question was, what is your average annual patient number? And you can see there that between um, 0 to 2,500 was the most common, so that would be a, a typical practice. And you, you see the bigger practices here with greater than 20,000 per annum, but the, the, the more common one there was between 0 to 2,500. Second question was approximately what percentage of patients present signs of age-related macular degeneration? And again, we see coming out here, 10% um, being the more common respondent um, answer there, that around 10% of people that enter a practice, they would consider to have some signs of age-related mm. macular degeneration. And you see, again, some people suggesting that up to 80% of patients have macular degeneration, and we can only um, suggest that this is due to um, clinic specialising in, in older populations. Um, in terms of getting into the meat of the survey then, what assessments were routinely performed to check for the presence, 
So whether it was there or even at risk of age-related macular degeneration. And um, as a non-optometrist, I found this uh, answer quite interesting. I was surprised, I have to admit, to see that the Amsler grid remains the most common technique for assessing and managing age-related macular degeneration. I can understand why. It's around feasibility. It doesn't cost much to have um, this, this um, Amsler grid for assessment. But um, obviously we've moved on with respect to our capacity to assess age-related macular degeneration and manage age-related macular degeneration. And fundus photography, an obvious one. Um, I was very interested to see that over 100 people suggested that they, they measure macular pigment. And because uh, I know for a fact that there's not that amount of machines around the UK, so <laughs> that, that, uh, maybe they have a new way that we haven't learned yet. So if anyone here knows, I'd be delighted to, to learn. But, um, but the, 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 the usual ones then as well, OCT coming in as a, as a common method, which as we all know holds a, a lot of potential for, for looking at, at this disease. Risk assessment, I was uh, encouraged to see that the optometrist in Ireland and the UK is actively involved in appropriate risk assessment based on the lecture this morning looking at the combined effect of, of risk factors. So that, I think that's important. But I think the message from this is that, you know, okay, the Amsel grid, maybe, maybe it has a, a role and a purpose, but I really believe that, you know, in the epidemic that AMD presents, given your specialty, given that you're first line, we need to look at the... the, the um, more sophisticated uh, techniques to try and help patients. That would be my, my gut view on it anyway. Um, yeah, I had to go on and ask about macular pigment, of course. If you measure macular pigment, which device do you use? Again, some interesting um, answers here. Um, only 3.7%, and you can see why now that disagrees with the previous answer. 3.7% of practices reported that they measure macular pigment to assess risk of AMD. 13 um, reported that they used a macuscope, which is, um, I believe, not available anymore. Um, 13 used the MPOD. Uh, one is using the Zeiss Physicam, which is uh, obviously new, only new on the market, but there was one um, respondent there that reported that. And then you can see some, again, some funny answers here that, again, if I can figure out how they achieved to measure macro pigment with that technology, I'd like to know. Um, so the message here, the clear message here is that measurement of macular pigment is not common in Ireland or the UK. And there's many reasons for that, and I'll come to that in the, in the next, final part of my lecture when we speak about the challenges of measuring macular pigment. But if one is to um, understand the potential and what we've been discussing throughout the day around carotenoids and nutrition, um, essentially, the, in my opinion anyway, the optometrist needs to be measuring macular pigment if, if the device is available, of course. So we'll discuss that. Um, next question, question five, is on supplements. Do you currently recommend eye supplements for patients with age-related macular degeneration? No surprise there to see that the majority of respondents would recommend the supplement for patients with age-related macular degeneration. And obviously some people still, um, over 100 respondents, felt that um, there was no need to do that, recommend nutritional supplements for patients with macular degeneration. Um, again, I was interested in this answer. Do, do you currently recommend eye supplements for patients at risk of developing age-related macular degeneration? I was very surprised uh, to see um, the large number of respondents that actually do recommend nutritional supplements for the at-risk group. And, you know, th there's one current theme throughout my, my lectures today is that you know, if nutrition and if, if macular pigment and the macular carotenoids is to be protective and afford support by reducing the antioxidant stress, or sorry, the oxidative stress and the blue light damage, it needs to be by definition over time. Okay, and that's why this is encouraging to see that people are making informed decisions around the at-risk group and making recommendations. So I was very surprised and encouraged um, given that I'm obviously in support of nutrition uh, for AMD to see that that's happening. Again, then we needed to find out why do people, what, what determines the, the optometrist's decision to, to recommend this. And we can see here that um, which supplements do they recommend first is the first question. And this is interesting. Um, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the various um, body of supplements available. On the left here, we can see the respondents' answers um, for for respondents that recommend more than one supplement. So here we can see that eye caps, which is the Alcon supplement, 
I believe it contains about six milligrams of lutein. I, I stand corrected on that, but I think that's what it is. Um, Macu Shield is the a lot of the data that you've seen this morning. That was the group two group where we were able to rebuild central pigment. Uh, Macu Shield is now uh, very close in terms of its. Um, um, prevalence and use in, in the UK and Ireland and then you have the other ones as well you have the Bosch and Lom products here Occupied Lutein, Occupied Preservation and, and um, many other uh, possible carotenoid uh, supplements. Um, there was also interestingly some practices that actually only recommended one supplement and that data is presented here on the right hand side and so some people have just made a decision that they're going to go with one supplement over the other for, for all cases and here we see that ICAPS um, again slightly ahead of, of, of MacuShield for um, as it stands and then Occupite Lutein, Occupite Preservation, the Bosch and Lom supplements which can, um, the Lutein obviously contains Lutein and the Occupite Preservation is similar to what the ARIDS formula, well it's, it's, it's mirrored on the ARIDS formula. So that's, that's what you're doing with respect to um, supplements. Um, I'm obviously interested to see what determines that decision, what makes you decide you're going to recommend ICAPS or what makes um, you decide you're going to rec recommend Macu Shield, and we gave possible answers and you can see that people believed that the main reason for picking a particular supplement was regarding the scientific evidence that was available. The other ones coming in there were good branding, good value for money and a good salesperson. I think they're very honest answers really, aren't they? Um, but it, it is again encouraging to, to see that in theory, at least, people um, want to make recommendations based on the scientific evidence that's available to us. Um, but I, I, I have to make a, I have to make, I'll go to the next slide and then I'll make the point. The, the other question was, what was the main reason for not recommending supplements? And it, the opposite come in. Cost was a big one, which I understand totally. Um, no scientific evidence. Again, this is the optometrist that believes that nutrition has no role to play because the science hasn't proven it. Um, too time consuming to be discussing supplements and AMD in the practice. These are our, our other ones, of course. And then there was a mixture of other things. But I want to make a point that, you know, having been working in the field for nearly 10 years and having published uh, a lot of papers on this and read, obviously, the, the literature. Um, it is important when we speak about the scientific evidence that we understand um, what scientific evidence relates to a particular product. And it is important that we understand that, you know, lutein is not just lutein. There's a lot of factors, and, and you know, uh, David spoke nicely this morning about, you know, bioavailability and the factors influence and uptake. And we know for a fact, because we've tested it in the lab, that, you know, it depends on how one consumes um, the, the supplements. Are they in an oil? Are they in just a, a capsule? We, we, we'd know. So there's all these important matrix issues that affect uptake. But essentially the message is that you know, if you want to look at scientific evidence, you must look at the particular supplements that have the clinical trials that have conducted and the companies that have invested in that. And um, you know, the companies I'm familiar with, Bosch and Lam have done a lot of work with their Occupied products, for example scientific studies, funding research, and test and response, and so on, and impact of augmentation. Um, MacuVision, MacuHealth, the Howard Foundation have invested a significant amount of um, funds to allow the scientists to do clinical trials and test um, supplements, not just for response, but for safety and everything. And, you know, so it's important that, that, that you understand that. The, the Alcon um, ICAPS one, I believe has been successful because of a very good marketing campaign on the back of what ARITS has shown. But you know, it's important that, and I, I, I say this clearly, that you know, the, the Alcon supplement is not the ARITS formula. That's very clear. And I'm not familiar with one single study that was conducted um, with, with the ICAP supplement. Um, so I wanted to make that point. Um, Question 10, what factors influence your decision to recommend eye supplements, if any? Okay, okay, so with respect to the disease and the patients that you see, when do you actually say, okay, this patient may, may benefit or oh, may need it? Um, patients with advanced AMD with affected vision, the dry type was the, was the leader there, that makes sense to me. Patients with uh, early AMD with no affected vision, drews and pigmentary changes. And I suppose the, the clinical trial data would be more in support of this um, because that's what's been tested. Can we reduce progression? And, and essentially that's what we, we have data on. Um, patients with advanced AMD with, 
with the with Professor Beasley will kill me, but I'll use it. The wet type of age-related macular degeneration. So that's coronal neovascularization, advanced type. And I suppose the, re the reason why this is less is people feel that it's too late. But remember as well, if someone has wet AMD, we do have two eyes, and it may not be developed in the fellow eye. So there may be an opportunity to um, provide protection there. Also, you know, would I recommend uh, nutritional supplements to people with advanced AMD? wet type and coordinated vascularization, I think I would. I think I would. I, I, if not just for the potential to help with the degeneration and, and the it has implications for vision, which we'll learn about in the next lecture, particularly around glare, a symptom that, that that's really a problem with, with macular degeneration. Um, so patients at known risk of developing uh, AMD uh, with no affected vision, but they have a a positive family history or they, they commit to the fact that they have a poor diet, they smoke cigarettes, all, all of the above. Um, you can see that that's now again creeping in to be an, uh, an important reason that, that the optometrists in Ireland and the UK feel for making recommendation. Again I have to say it and I know I sound like a broken record but the, the real point is and you know based on what I understand about this field, getting busy early with nutrition equals here. which from a business perspective for you guys means that there's a lot more people that you can discuss the benefits of nutrition and supplements with. Everyone that comes into your practice is at some degree of risk, so that, that would be my view on it. Um, question 11, within the last 12 months approximately how many patients have you recommended eye supplements to? And again you can see here that some practices have been very busy but typically between I would say um, 21 to 50 is, is what came out to be the most common there. Um, within the last 12 months, approximately how many patients have you noticed or that the patients themselves have reported an improvement in their AMD following recommendation of the eye supplement? An extremely crude question, of course. You know, very, it depends on how one interprets an improvement. So that can be interpreted in any way. But we just wanted to get some sense of scale as to you know, what the optometrist felt and maybe what their patient was reporting. And this question is in there based on the many, I suppose, clinical cases we've seen. I know Professor Beattie's clinic, he, uh, we were receive uh, several letters a month from Professor Beattie's clinic with patients actually reporting subjective visual improvement and Professor Beattie clinically noticing improvements. Um, again, not in the context of a clinical trial, but in real life it's, this, this is happening. So um, we tried to quantify which supplement that was related to as well. And there was a clear, statistically, there was a clear message um, around um, MacuShield, which um, based on the scientific discussions this morning, the combined synergistic effect, the, the um, enhanced uh, light filtering properties when you have all three, it makes sense. Think of Paul Bernstein's publication, think of the, the clinical data I've shown you, how we can enrich pigment with this. There's, there's a tone and there's a sense coming out now from, from the optometrists and from the patients that there's something very good and something very positive happening. Um, with uh, MacaShield. Eye caps as well, there was a uh, suggestion of improvement with, with, with the eye cap supplement and various combinations, but statistically, when we worked with our statistician, Dr. Jim Stack, we could see that there was a clear, um, clear uh, advantage to the um, MacaShield uh, sup supplement in that case. And, and that's important. The next step now for us is to um, go back to each of these and, and try and quantify it with a bit more accuracy by looking at fundus photographs, etc. And, and that's phase two of, of this investigation, which we will, of course, um, um, try and achieve. We will publish this data as agreed with the college in, in, in the UK. So this data will be published in the college journal. So you, you will get to see that hopefully quite soon. Um, in addition, many respondents report that they felt the eye supplement helped reduce risk of progression of AMD, although it is important to point out that this question was not directly asked in, in the survey. Okay, so that that's wants to give, um, give you a, a small tone for what, what the respondents that, that participate in this survey um, are currently doing. And would I just get a show of hands for people in this room that actually feel they would agree with that based on what they do? Just generally, would people, so a hand for people who would agree with what the, the, the survey has thrown up. Okay, so it's, it's, it's the majority of the room and we don't need to do, do the other. So yeah, okay. So the next thing, I just need to change my, my presentation here.
Okay. So now, the final part of my le lecture, I suppose, is, is um, again, let's, we're on point three. Point one was what we know, where we are with clinical trials. I've just given you a sense for what's common practice in the UK and Ireland. And now I'm just going to have a discussion with you about what I think the tools we should be using, what's available to the optometrist to um, use the scientific studies and make recommendations and, and, and run a, a business that has a primarily advantages for the patient, but that's successful for you also. Um, so measuring macular pigment, you know, in, over the next four days, you're going to have uh, 60 carotenoid scientists in, in this room. And I don't think any of them will uh, truly agree on the best method for measuring macular pigment. It's, it's been an ongoing debate, and I think it will be ongoing for, for some time. Um, so it has been the challenge, because of course, if, if one wants to publish and, and work on clinical trials that, that speak to macular pigment, you have to be able to measure it. And it is, by the way, and I don't think any of us mentioned this today, it is the one advantage of, of carotenoids, and particularly the macular carotenoids. They're the only antioxidants that you can actually measure properly in vivo. You know, and in the eye, you can actually measure the amount of this pigment in the eye, and that's, that's the advantage, uh, but also the challenge, I suppose, for us. Here's what we're trying to measure. We're trying to go through the eye, through the matrix. We're trying to measure what's going on here across its spatial profile. Again, look at its selectivity here. This is slightest courtesy of um, Professor Max Snodderly. And um, so we're trying to measure this pigment. And the idea for the optometrist is if you make recommendations around nutrition, positive lifestyle changes, supplements, can you detect change in that in a way? So that, that's what the challenge. Um, how do we measure pigment? What, what do we know? So there's two, there's two ways one can do it. We can measure it objectively or we can measure it subjectively. Okay? Objectively, just to remind you something that I suppose, you know, something that requires less input from, from the from the patient, from the subject. Of course, it's not totally objective. I think a, a more correct term, and um, Professor Wooten will, would, would, would like me to use the term uh, physical and non-physical as the methods, but I think we'll be comfortable today to use this. Um, so the objective me measurements are essentially a situation where you get the patient, you place them in the seat, and you have some piece of equipment that you press a button and you get a number that one would hope is meaningful. The methods that have been available are Raman, fundus autofluorescence, fundus reflectance, the subjective ones, which involves uh, an interaction with, with the patient, are motion photometry and heterochromatic flicker photometry. Now that's a mouthful, but I'm not going to discuss uh, motion photometry today <coughs> because it's not, it's not commonly used at all. <clears throat> okay, so of the objective ones, here's a Raman, and we've used all these, by the way, in, in various clinical trials. We're truly interested to have an objective measurement of pigment if one exists. We use Raman in, in the Karma trial and you'll, you'll hear a little bit of data today on the Karma trial from Dr. Lockman. And the idea here is that you um, basically excite the carotenoids with a laser and they give off uh, what, what's known as Raman scatter, which uh, is essentially is a unique fingerprint of, of the carotenoids. And the problem with Raman, however, is they report Raman counts, which is not even a real unit. So straight away, I think the bait goes into that. Um, you have autofluorescence. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. And fundus reflectance as the other two. So the Raman, as I say, uh, produces light scattering molecules, which are referred to as Raman scattering. Um, and it produces this fingerprint, but the no counts point I've already made. Um, let's quickly go to the instrument. It's not quite pretty, wouldn't, I don't think you'd like it in your nice practices. Um, we've used it, as I say, in clinical trials. You get this report here that gives you a Raman count that's supposed to be and um, is related to the, the carotenoid concentration in the eye. The advantage is, of course, it's uh, objective, it's rapid, um, it claims to measure pigment in all ages, but uh, the problem is, in its disadvantages, is that um, pupil size is a major problem here. And as we know, as, we get, as our patients get older, there's an issue with um, pupil size. And it significantly impacts on the, the measurement. And for that reason, all data from this technology is essentially skewed. And you see very strong age declines that I don't believe are, are true. It's expensive, difficult to maintain. It broke down a lot on us when we had it. Um, the technology broke down a lot and we found it very difficult to get it replaced and fixed. So is it suitable for the clinical setting? Absolutely not. Would I use it in a scientific study? Not anymore. Um, uh, fundus autofluorescence, this had a lot of promise. 
two wavelengths, you, uh, you take two pictures of the eye and you subtract one from the other. And uh, obviously at um, uh, 488 is, is, is where macular pigment will, will absorb and at 514 it doesn't and you can subtract one from the other and in theory you can get a, a nice profile of the um, pigment such as what you see here. Um, this has been used in various macular pigment studies. Um, not so common anymore, again, because of the challenges of maintaining the equipment, the expense associated with it, but also because of the assumptions that have not yet been addressed. Um, and you can see there's a lot of them. One big one for me is that there's an assumption that lipofoscin is evenly distributed across the retina, which of course it isn't. And that is the, the, a prior, an important requirement if we're to measure pigment using this technology. Um, I also believe that the, la the argon laser is was dangerous. I believe the, the energy of that laser used in this machine is something I certainly wouldn't like going into my eye. So have I used it in a clinical trial? No. Would, do I recommend it for the clinical setting? No. Um, dilation again is a problem here. Funnus reflectance, yeah, we see the Visicam on display today. It's probably of the objective um, measures, the, the only one that's surviving and striving to try and um, deal with the assumptions. But again, it has limitations and issues. Um, it, it, it has many of them, in fact. And, you know, essentially you need, the eye is a very difficult piece of equipment, if you, if you think about it. And, and to, to measure reflectance and subtract all the um, confounders is, is, is the challenge here and I don't believe yet that um, we've arrived at a situation that that can be done but essentially um, you know a comment on, on the Visicam is that it has only one wavelength and for me that that makes no sense in terms of how we can accurately measure pigment when there's only one wavelength used um, in that measurement. Um, again I've, I've pretty much discussed those but all those do in fact in theory well require dilation. I know you can claim that, um, the Visicam claims that you don't need dilation, it's non-midriatic, but I know from experience using it that, you know, it's much easier when, when, when the patient is dilated. Um, so the overall um, disadvantage and I suppose issues associated with measuring pigment objectively thus far is dilation, significant training is required, but that's the case for any measurement, artifacts not validated, may be dangerous for the subject and expensive. And I don't, I, I, you know, I'd love one, as I say, I'd love an objective measure. I will use it when it's there. But for me, and for now, we're not there yet. That's my message. Um, and that's why we use Flickr. And that's really what I want to speak to you about today. Um, the idea around Flickr is, is, is simple, but it's brilliant. And, like, and, the, and the idea here is that we actually use the eye as its own control. So what you do is you, essentially, you measure the, um, you're looking for a minimum flicker point and that achieved when you have what we call isoluminance. The amount of, so you have two lights, you have two LEDs, a, a, a blue and a green, and when they're in the same intensity they appear steady to the subject. And that is of course different for everyone based on, on, on many um, factors. So what you do is you have um, a dial or your operator has a dial, you can do it, you can try it out here, you change the intensity of the blue you do that in the fovea where we have the central pigment and you do it again in the parafovea. And you can subtract one from, you get a log ratio in fact of one to the other which gives you what we call optical density macular pigment which is a real unit. Essentially it's compressed light um, absorption. That's a measure of compressed light absorption. But the, as I say, and I'm, I'll make this point again, the key advantage here is that the subject is their own control. So any issues with cataract, for example, again, okay, cataract was something I didn't measure. That's a big, a big issue for the objective um, techniques. Um, cataract is a problem. But with HFP it's not because the ratio is within a given eye. And we've proven this, we've published data um, actually on a bunch of cataract patients where we measured their pigment before they had cataract surgery and we measured it after. And the take home message was that you get the exact same value. Now the values that derive the macular pigment were very different. Before surgery you needed a lot of um, blue in the fovea to get through the cataract. But also you did in the periphery. So it went up and down based on the intensity of the cataract. So that, that's a major advantage. You know, crudely, it's a difficult technique if you do not optimize it. If you do not optimize the flicker frequency, make it easy for the, the subject to use. The, and Professor Wooten's technology is the one I've been using and I have done because it offers what we call customized flicker 
um, and it allows us really set up the test that A, the patient or the subject can perform the measurement, but, but, but B, we have confidence in it. It's also important to mention that that technology is the only technology that has been validated scientifically. And it's been validated in many ways, A, comparison to biochemical markers, but B, comparing it to the in vitro spectrum absorption curve of the carotenoids. So if you, for example, change the wavelength in the device, you'll get this spectral absorption curve of the macular carotenoids with this device in, in the human. And that fits perfectly onto the in vitro spectral absorption curve of the carotenoids. So it's a key but an essential step if one is to validate it. And my suggestion to all the other technologies that, that claim to measure macular pigment, they need to go to the extent that um, Professor Wooten and his team have gone to to really validate um, the, the technology because it's essential that we, the numbers we get and the numbers we make recommendations on are meaningful. And if you give a patient who's at risk of AMD a supplement that when you measure them in six months or 12 months that you have the capacity to measure change if that change exists. And it has to be done in a real way. So as you can see, I'm a big supporter of Flickr and I'm a big supporter of um, Professor Wooten's technology. Um, here you go. It's not something you would want in your clinic either. It's not a pretty thing. Um, Professor Wooten won't like me saying that. Um, here's how we optimize a change in flicker frequencies, etc. And this is what we use in the scientific lab. And it does require a lot of training. The, the, the researcher, we would invest a lot of time with uh, researchers getting them to do uh, pilot trials until they reach a standard that we're happy they are able to use this technique and they're able to get the patient, more importantly, to use this technique. There's a very succinct training manual that comes with it and video to help in, in the demonstration. Um, Okay, it has disadvantages, of course, it's subjective. It requires the patient to be able to look at Flickr and tell you when it's gone or <coughs> determine it himself when it's gone. That is the criteria. We published data in Max Nodderley's lab in Augusta, Georgia, um, where we actually did the measurements in AMD patients. And, you know, even with patients with really poor vision, as long as they were able to see Flickr and determine it disappear, we were able to perform the measurement. And that data is, of course, published as well. Scientifically, here's the stimulus when you look in, you see all different sizes and essentially all you need to know here is that it refers to different parts of, of the different eccentricities essentially across the retina. And um, this last one here is the seven degree measurement where you fixate here and you have the two degree stimulus so the patient gets the flicker to go away there and that gives you your reference point. And I, act, well, I actually think that's the easiest um, measurement to perform with this. Um, the, the patient may feel different, but I, I feel it, it is the easiest. And it gives us this profile, and here's half the mountain of pigment that I've been talking to you about today. This is how we do it. Um, you measure at different eccentricities, and it's very easy to change the size of the stimulus if you wanted to do more or if you wanted to do less, but um, that, that, that's where we are for now. Gives us that data. What does this all mean for you clinically? What, what is, are we ready for something in the clinic setting to measure pigment? Um, the macuscope I don't even think is around anymore, so we, we it used Flickr, used HFP, but it, it didn't, when it came to market, it didn't have any of the customization opportunities um, that the densitometer would offer, for example. And, and for me, that's why it, it failed. Um, it was one of the reasons, anyway. Um, the M-Pod, again, uh, uses... A, Flickr technology, but in, 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 in the, the reverse, you, you, you predict when Flickr appears. Patients do find it uh, easier, I think, to, to, um, to, to use that because it's easier to identify when Flickr appears as opposed to disappearing. But we'll talk about, we did a study on that and we'll talk about that briefly. Um, the VisuCam, again, as I said, I would love a, a funnel's camera that will give me macular pigment data that I can rely on, but I think work needs to be done in the area of reflectance um, if we are to, to really use it clinically and in scientific studies. The densitometer which is on display today, um, I, I, I think, yes, it's, it's subjective, but it's, if you want to measure macro pigment with accuracy, this is what, what you need to have, in, in, in my opinion. It's not going to work if, 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 if you get it and you leave it there and expect it to run itself. It won't. You'll need a, a Mr. or Mrs. AMD in your clinic that gets trained on this, that understands this, and that can, can use it um, um, 
in the, in the clinic setting properly and they understand the challenges that this presents because it's, it's not perfect, it is subjective but if I had a practice it's absolutely the technology I would use. Um, just to point out, the densitometer only measures at one eccentricity and that's all I, I believe is realistic for the clinic setting. So uh, once you're trained or once your technician is trained in this, you can do a, a valid measurement in probably five to eight minutes, maybe concede 10 minutes to do an, a, an accurate measurement. And it, there's all checks built in that if there's variation, you'll be able to identify that and correct for it. So, um, so I think it's good news for the optometry community. I think if the stat that I showed you earlier is going to change around how we measure this, this would be the one I would hope would, would, would be used. Um, in terms of the MPOD, which is common in the UK, um, we did a, actually Dr. Lockman's lab did a comparison between the densitometer which we claim as the gold standard and this technology and we found a good correlation, they correlated quite well um, but the problem was that it tended to underestimate significantly the amount of pigment um, patients were having. The other thing I will mention about the MPOD, if you do have one and if you are using it, there is some suggestions that you don't need to do the parafoveal measurement when you're doing this and um, uh, that's absolutely nonsense. You may as well not do it at all. It, you cannot do the measurement without investing time in the parafoveal measurement. Um, other problems, I believe, with the, um, the MPS is um, the, the stimulus at seven degrees is, is, is only a one degree stimulus and it makes the task extremely difficult uh, for, the, for the subject. And um, yeah, I think that's basically it. So conclusion on how we measure pigment. HFP remains the current gold standard for measuring pigment. However, all methods using HFP are not the same. Okay, so just because it uses HFP, it's not the same. It has to have, has to essentially, for now in my opinion, be the densitometer in the clinic setting. It has to be um, the clinical version I've just shown you. Um, customized HFP provides the most reliable option for measuring macular pigment for both scientific and clinic settings. Um, so let's just say you do that, let's just say we decide that you're going to measure pigment, how do you bring it all together? Because of course macular pigment is only one part of a very important jigsaw and there's all these other factors that we've been discussing throughout today, age, obesity, nutrition, light exposure um, and so on and so forth. So that's why um, several years ago myself, Stephen Beattie and Graeme O'Regan decided that we wanted to have an information website on the risk factors to help the eye care professional but it actually developed into a software program which is on display today, um, the site risk one and I wanted to show you this because I think it may be something that will be useful for you. So essentially what we've done is we've looked at all the literature, the data I showed you this morning was over 500 um, research publications, 300 of those were selected with the highest impact and es essentially we extrapolated all the odds ratios from those difficult and years of scientific studies. So we got a, a weighting essentially for which risk factor was important and which risk factor wasn't so important. We um, have integrated that into a, an online mathematical calculation that goes on in the background that takes all these risk factors and adds them together in, in a very unique way. It's similar to what happens with logistic regression but this is a, a novel development um, in terms of how we extrapolate the, the data. Um, so let's just look at the type of information you can put into this online software. Obviously the patient's name, their age, age the most important risk factor that goes in there. This is it's defaulted at 70. This is the age we're going to predict in percentage terms their risk of developing macular degeneration. So at the age of 70, Mr. X has a Y percent chance of developing this condition. Brilliant advancements now, as I mentioned this this morning, is the opportunity to do a mucosal swab, um, find out whether we have the risk genes or not. Um, this again, uh, there's a company in Germany called Abiga Vision, and uh, Mr. Kuckling is, is, is one of the distributors today, and he has... Um, the opportunity to provide this where um, mucosal swabs can be taken, they're sent to the lab in Germany and within a few days the, the, uh, the practice gets um, back that patient's report and I think that's a fantastic development that we can now look at the genes in a real way, the genes that we know really 
determine whether we're getting this condition or not. So that's something that has been integrated. There's a new development into the mathematical model and the online software. Now, if you don't have the option to do the, the swab, there's an, there's an option to click information unavailable. And the confidence around the calculation is, of course, less. Smoking, diet, um, supplement use, ethnicity, body mass, and there's all help options there to get, gather the infa Im information. But once the, the optometrist is clear on the, 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 the questions, and once they do it a couple of times, it becomes second nature, and it becomes something that can be formed very painlessly indeed um, in the clinic setting. Um, then you go on to ocular risks, and if you do have the fancy technology that we've been discussing, such as um, fundus cameras, and you're looking at drusen and so on, you can put that information in there. But again, it's not really relevant to Drusen because I believe this technology is more suited to everyone in the practice that doesn't have AMD. Everybody that doesn't have AMD. That's where we can use the preventive strategy to help ourselves here. Uh, macular pigment, again, if you have the machine to measure it, that data gets, gets put in. It's important, again, I point out that if you do not have that, that opportunity, you, you just don't add it to, to the calculation. Um, what does this mean? What does this do? Essentially, you get two lines on the graph. The green line is the, is the patient's risk of developing age-related macular degeneration based on the information put in to the calculator. The blue line is the risk of macular degeneration if they take the advice of the software, which you can see on the next page. But essentially, the idea here is that we want to take this risk and optimize it to here. Okay, and this all sounds very simple, but here we have the first opportunity to look in a collective way and in a personalized way and in a customized way that your patients can be assessed. Um, here you see all the, this is an example of one patient and this is in, in order of importance based on the scientific literature they get recommendations about um, smoke and cessation and nutrition, uh, protecting against light and so on and so forth. The eye care professional simply prints that, the patient goes home with it, and they have a copy for, for their records, and the patient can then be reassessed after that. But ultimately, the idea is that we, we deal with this problem. And, um, you know, I think, as I said at the start of my lecture today, the, the optometrist is, is key to this, is key to dealing with this problem. You are the first line of eye care providers. We've seen from the World Health Organization that age-related macular degeneration is already the leading cause of blindness. We know we have an aging population. We know we live in an aging society. We know lifestyle um, is changing for the worse. This is not just a, a key opportunity for you to help your, your patients, but it's a key opportunity to advance in terms of what you, your clinical practice um, can offer, and it has, makes absolute perfect business sense as well. So again, that concludes my lectures um, to you today. I'd love now to answer any questions questions you may have around my recommendations and what I've been discussing with you today. Thank you very much.